Welcome everybody. We'll get started shortly. We're just letting everybody come into the room. Good morning, everybody. We are going to begin in just a few more minutes. We've got a few more people that we're letting into the room. Okay, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Tuesday Talks with Tobin. I would like to introduce Mark Tobin, ADL Southwest Regional Director. Take it away, Mark. Thank you, Margie, and thanks everyone for joining uh, for the monthly uh, Talks with Tobin. Uh, today, we're gonna be talking immigration reform with Brandon, Brandon Roche. Uh, and before I introduce him, uh, I just wanna share ADL's immigration policy, uh, which uh, takes into consideration our longstanding work um, in this area. And because ADL is rooted in a community that um, has experienced the plight of living as refugees uh, throughout uh, its history. Uh, we've advocated for fair and humane immigration policy since our founding in 1913 leading the way in exposing and fighting against xenophobic rhetoric and policies that threaten the lives of immigrants, asylum seekers, and refugees. ADL supports a holistic approach to immigration policy that includes, one, a path to citizenship for undocumented immigrants, uh, two, fair treatment and equal access to human and legal services for immigrants, three, recommitment to our obligation to safeguard migrants in danger, and four, a humane border security strategy. Uh, to achieve these goals, uh, we continue to press Congress to pass comprehensive immigration reform. Uh, to help us understand the status of uh, immigration reform today, uh, particularly the pending US Citizenship Act of 2021, I've invited uh, a noted immigration expert, uh, immigration attorney, Brandon Roche, uh, Brandon is a former clinical supervising attorney with the University of Houston Law Center's Immigration Clinic. He also served as a senior staff attorney with the American Bar Association's Children's Immigration Law Academy. And prior to that role, he was a supervising attorney with Catholic Charities of Houston uh, Cabrini Center for Immigrant Legal Assistance, where he helped build and oversee a team of attorneys offering free legal representation to hundreds of unaccompanied minors in the Houston area. Between undergraduate and law school, Brandon served as a Peace Corps volunteer in Honduras. Uh, now, Brandon is an immigration attorney with his own law firm, Brandon Roche PC, which may be found at Roche Immigration, uh, which I will put in the chat if you wanna reach out to him. Brandon, uh, thank you so much for joining. Uh, and I, I really thank you for uh, taking time to share uh, your thoughts and expertise on this, uh, this really complex and, and divisive subject. Uh, this is one of those subject matters, which in and of itself would be really challenging to solve. But when you mix in uh, the politics and the divisiveness and the way that immigration has been used as a 
as a wedge issue, uh, it becomes and has become almost, uh, you know, from the outside, it looks almost unsolvable because people's uh, opinions and thoughts about what to do on immigration are so diametrically opposed. Um, yet, perhaps if you could take, you know, people into a room and remove sort of the politics of it, probably you could come up with some reasonable solutions. But we are right now very far away from that opportunity. Um, the first question is, and this may seem, uh, you know, a kind of very basic or even mundane question, but without changing the laws uh, that we have on the books right now, would it be possible to uh, improve our immigration situation uh, just by changing um, the way either that we enforce our current laws or by changing the way um, that we look at immigration? Well, um, first off, thanks for having me. I'm, I'm happy to, uh, always happy to speak about immigration issues. And um, you mentioned how people often have very pre preconceived notions of, of immigration and, and what should and shouldn't be. And, and the reason I love to speak uh, to anyone and any, anyone willing to listen about immigration issues in the United States is to try to further educate the public because I find that most people don't quite understand the, the nuances that are involved. Um, and so I'm, I'm happy to be here for that reason. And to your question, can you can you change it without changing the laws or can you you know reform the immigration system as it is without overhauling the the, the legislation i guess it would be difficult i think that's kind of like trying to solve um houston's traffic issues without addressing the uh the amount of lanes in, on the freeway or something to that effect right you could certainly take certain measures maybe you could say certain people can only drive on certain days or something but uh it's not really going to address the underlying issues and the same thing goes with immigration uh, a lot of the underlying issues first off are what's causing people to flee from their home countries right and there are all those problems in certain countries that are causing people to come here in such high numbers and then you have what happens once they get here and how they're treated and some of those things can be done differently and they are being done differently than they were under the previous administration. Take, for example, the Remain in Mexico policy. That was um, where immigrants arriving at our southern border had to wait in Mexico for their proceedings. Um, and now those immigrants are allowed at least to enter the United States and often staying in some sort of a detention facility, whether it's a camp or uh, they're calling them welcome centers. In some cases, the, the Dallas Convention Center comes to mind. There are different settings for different people, um, depending on their age or, or other factors. Point being, that's a major change and, and it's a change in just the way we treat people. You know, I don't like to see anybody in a detention facility, certainly not children, but it's certainly better than keeping them in a homeless camp on the Mexico side of the border where they're subject to um, kidnapping and, and assault by cartels. So there are those changes that we can do to have more humane policies in place without having to overhaul the laws themselves. But then you end up running into a traffic jam, if you will, at some point in the process, because those people need to be able to further their claims to get their day in court, if you will. And that's where we truly need immigration reform to allow for uh, a more effective and just system that allows them to make their claims in court and to show why they should be able to stay here. So how would you describe what's happening at the border currently? So what's happening, uh, and I'll speak specifically to the southern border, that's what uh, is in the news and what, what most people are discussing. And it's primarily got to do with uh, children coming to the border in large numbers, uh, the unaccompanied minors that have made the headlines so much, even since 2014. Uh, but now there are very large numbers coming across. The, a lot of that has to do with, with many factors a lot of it too was, was pent up demand, if you will. Some of those kids were being kind of forced to wait in Mexico, so they weren't crossing previously. The media is also reporting extremely high numbers year over year. So if you compare it to spring of last year, you're gonna get a much higher number because that was the height of the COVID pandemic and even migration slowed down in the middle of all that. So year over year, yeah, the numbers are much higher than they, what they were in 2020 at this time. Um, but we typically see seasonal migration patterns in the spring uh, where the numbers of people crossing the border spike 
around this time of year every time because it's easier to make the journey through Mexico uh, weather patterns and such at this time of year. So it's not necessarily the crisis that it's being made out to be, but it certainly is uh, extremely high numbers due to so many different factors. Uh, another one of those factors is, as I mentioned before, some of the things that force people to leave their country in the first place, right? Emigration with an E. Uh, and that is the typical corruption and gang control you see in Central America, but more so there were two major hurricanes that hit Central America last fall, uh, late October, early November, I want to say. And that really devastated what little infrastructure was left in some of the major cities and you know, just further exacerbated some of those problems, forcing people to finally now in the spring realize that there's nothing there for them and they're going to have to try to come here to seek asylum, which by the way is the legal and proper way to do so. Arrive at the border, present yourself to a, a customs or border patrol official and ask for asylum in the United States. And that's how you begin the process of seeking it. So arriving at the southern border is actually the way it is uh, designed. And and to clarify, that the the people who are uh, either seeking entrance or are coming into the southern border uh, right now, they are asylum seekers. Is that correct? And they are not people who are entering the country illegally. Uh, or if maybe you can well, clarify that for us. Yeah. Yeah. So I I do believe the vast majority of those arriving at the southern border are seeking asylum. Um, whether or not they qualify for asylum is a whole different right. question. And that goes to what I was saying before, we need reform in our legal system to give them their day in court. But uh, they don't have to ask for asylum. They can, um, some do cross in, uh, and then what they do is they'll cross into the United States and then present themselves to officials or get captured by officials. Uh, the vast majority of the children turn themselves over as soon as they cross the border. Um, in a lot of cases, they're not actually able to approach the bridge and approach a CBP official at the border and, and go through the process properly because the, the agents were turning them away, saying, oh, we're not taking asylum seekers right now, uh, which is uh, in violation of all sorts of international treaties and our own law. But so what they would do is they would cross in uh, without authorization and cross the river or whatever other means. And then the children typically just wait on the other side until a border patrol official comes along. And I say that I've spoken to probably thousands of kids personally, and I've supervised attorneys who have spoken to, you know, many more. Almost to a person, those children will say, I, I just waited there. I just tried to, you know, wait for uh, someone. And then they'll be put into the system, uh, how we treat unaccompanied children and put them into shelters and, and then get them to a loved one so they can await their day in court at that point. But they don't have to ask for asylum. There are other things that they can uh, qualify for. Special immigrant juvenile status is one that is uh, quite common to see. That is for children who were abandoned, abused, or neglected in their home country. And then you have to get a judicial order, so a state court order from a state court judge saying that this child was indeed abandoned, abused, or neglected by one or both of their parents, and that it's not in their best interest to return to their home country. The idea there being Let's say a child has a, a mom in, in Atlanta. They come across the border. They're trying to go live with mom who's been here trying to work and, and send money home. Dad abandoned or abused the child back home. The idea is that we're not going to send that child back to a situation where they're going to be put in further harm. Um, and it does take quite a bit of proof, of course, to, to show a judge to get that type of an order that would allow them to then apply for it. Uh, and that only applies for children who are uh, under 21. So point being, there are other ways they could get some type of legal status in the United States or some track towards permanent residency aside from asylum. And asylum right now is extremely difficult to win for most Central Americans, especially. And, and I just, I mean, I ask that question because I, I think that when it is, you know, presented in, in the media or in most people's impression is there isn't a lot of clarity in terms of people's status. It's, it's, first of all, it's complex. Um, and as you just sort of, you know, explained, and so it's easy to um, kind of lump everyone into kind of one category, whether they, and, and how they're, um, uh, you know, given, you know, kinds of names that have uh, political uh, uh, elements to them. Um, and as opposed to kind of breaking it down in terms of the status of different people. 
And so that also makes the debate uh, much more challenging. So, so what you're saying is, you know, and this is not a surprise, is that the system uh, is in need of, of repair. And it sounds like it is in need of repair right now. Um, whether that those repairs will be able to, to, to begin certainly will depend upon whether, you know, Congress can, can pass something. Um, in February, uh, the U.S. Citizenship Act of 2021 was filed in both the House and the Senate. Um, this is a, uh, a very broad piece of legislation that has a number of uh, aspects to it. Um, can you kind of break down the essential elements uh, for us and give us an understanding of, of what is contained in this piece of uh, reform legislation? Sure. I mean, it's, it's pretty pretty large. Uh, I will specifically address the small piece of it that actually passed the House already and is going to go before the Senate. The, the rest of it is really still up for negotiation, and, and the idea would include far-ranging things like reforming the immigration courts, uh, potentially moving them to become freestanding institutions, actual courts, whereas right now they are uh, the immigration judges are employees of the Department of Justice. They're not real judges in that sense. Don't, don't tell them I said that. Um, <laughs> but there, there are a lot of Everybody, please keep that, <laughs> keep that confidential. A lot of uh, issues that could come to fruition, but the things that have the best chance of coming to fruition are, are those pieces, especially the piece that's already passed, which focuses on the dreamers, the, the people who were brought here as children, right? Uh, DACA recipients to a large degree. DACA is Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals. Again, you know, you have to have been brought here before the age of 16. You had to have been here on certain dates um, before 2007, been here in 2012. And you have to have graduated high school, um, be in the military or honorably discharged from the military, or, um, you know, you can be, you can be enrolled in college. There are a few other ways to uh, show essentially that you have good moral character. And then of course you have to pass criminal background checks and not have any, any uh, significant criminal history. I, anything more than two misdemeanors would be pretty much disqualifying with exceptions, of course. So my point being um, that is what's going through right now. And that, so what happens right now is there's DACA and people get DACA, but DACA is really what, in the legal world is considered prosecutorial discretion. It just says deferred action for childhood arrivals. It's deferring the action of deportation. So it's saying, hey, we could deport you if we wanted to, but we're not gonna because you know, you, you've been here a while, you're doing good things. It's cool, do what you wanna do. They get work authorization with that, but that's about it. They don't have any long-term prospects. It's very difficult for them to get um, student loans, for example, to go to college, uh, to get mortgage loans, to, to make their lives here. And it's certainly difficult um, you know, when you have to renew your employment status every year or two years, depending, and you're not sure that it's going to be renewed, it's hard for you to get long-term prospects of employment. So the idea with this particular bill would be to give them a path to eventually citizenship. It would put them on a path for what they call or what they're calling in the bill lawful prospective immigrant status. And so that makes them, instead of just being prosecutorial discretion and, and deferring the action of deportation, it gives them this actual status. And then after so many years, and again, they have to maintain their, their clean record and other factors, pay their taxes, all sorts of things like that that have to be proved. They could then become lawful permanent residents and go on to become citizens. The process would take seven to 10 years, depending on the person's kind of situation. So it's still a long process, uh, but at least gives them some um, sense of stability going forward. And most of these people, um, DACA recipients, especially, you know, they were brought here as children. They don't know their home country anymore. Their home country is the United States. Um, I've talked to, to many kids or, or now adults um, who qualify and don't even speak the, the home country language. In many cases, that's Spanish, but it doesn't have to be. So, you know, there are a lot of reasons why this will go a long way towards rectifying at least that small part of the immigration issue affecting those children. And, and to be clear, this only, uh, the, the piece that's uh, already going forward, it only uh, involves uh, kids who were part of the original DACA program, correct? Or is it, does it include any additional 
it does include additional. Yeah. So um, DACA is for those kids who have that status right now and they were able to gain it. Now you can again apply anew for DACA if you never applied before, but you still have to have entered before 2007. It would update that date to January 1st, 2021. So those people who entered between 2007 and 2021 could apply for this. They still have to be under the age limits and show all those other criteria. Um, and that would go a long way towards kind of bringing a lot of those kids, um, some of them who are now adults, out of the shadows and give them some stability going forward. It also would allow for um, what we kind of call legal dreamers, uh, those people who maybe didn't come here without any status. Maybe they came here because their parent had an H-1B worker visa and they came as the child of someone uh, with that type of visa, so they're derivative. Um, so they were in legal status when they came here, which disallowed them from getting that initial DACA application uh, or, or initial DACA uh, status. So those people who have now maybe turned 21 but want to stay here since they've been here so long um, could apply for and potentially qualify as well under this new part of the bill. Yeah, I also you know read that that one of the components is looking at you know immigration reform from a much uh, broader perspective, and you touched on this earlier on, which is uh, the immigration aspect of it, and focusing on uh, you know what can we do in order to uh, kind of eliminate people's need to come here as asylum seekers, you know, particularly in, in Central America and, and other places. Uh, can you talk about uh, what's contained in the bill that, that might alleviate those, those concerns? Sure, uh, not the part that has already passed the House, but in the broader bill, kind of what's, what's typically known as the Biden immigration bill. Uh, and it's, it's many pieces. It's not really just one bill because this deals more with foreign policy, right? And this is going to deal with- Well, you only have 30 minutes, so I'm trying to yeah. condense Yeah, I got you. I just wanted to, to, to be clear. Um, so there are some components in there that call for more foreign, foreign policy funding to Central American countries and others. And, and to be clear, this is not only Central American migrants arriving at the border. There are many African migrants in there. There are many, uh, Venezuela is having a, a massive emigration or migration um, due to the complete breakdown of their system. Um, so there are a lot of other countries and people from all over the world who are affected by this. Um, and yes, the Biden bill does have a component where they're calling for more foreign policy funding to try to alleviate some of the underlying causes of, um, you know, people having to leave. You know, when we, when we talk about immigration or what I'm teaching immigration to students, uh, I talk about push and pull factors, right? There's things that pull people to America, our economy, family ties, and things like that. And there's push factors that push them out of their home country. So, you know, you've got your your corruption, your gang influence, your lack of infrastructure and, and you know, typical economic breakdown, all those things. So there are a lot of factors that go into it. And the Biden bill does try to address some of that with better funding for foreign policy. Well, you know, you mentioned the, the hurricanes this past fall, and uh, at this point, I think we can only expect more kinds of natural, you know, disasters uh, all over, which may, you know, cause this to, to, to continue. Uh, we did have uh, w one question, and, you know, you, you hear about this all the time, but perhaps not as much as, as maybe we should, which is there are um, uh, a number of people you know, people in this country uh, who are now illegal because they, they came here legally either to go to school or to work um, whose visas have expired. Um, and I don't, I can't recall the number offhand, but it is a significant portion of the people who are here illegally. Um, number one, does the, does this uh, bill or any of the bills address that? Um, and if not, um, what are some of the considerations uh, that, that might be uh, being thought of as a way to, uh, to deal with this, this very pressing issue? Sure. Um, the bill does in, in several different ways, but there are so many different ways that someone could enter that it's hard for me to, to address it succinctly, I guess. Uh, but yeah, you're right. Let's take tourist visas, for example. Uh, many people come on a tourist visa and maybe overstay their visa. They then um, 
you know, maybe they, they're working without authorization and eventually they might try to marry a US citizen or, or somehow make their life here in other ways. Um, there are certain ways that the bill can address it, not by allowing that, of course, the US is still going to want people to, to leave when their authorized time is up. But there are ways where if you, for example, marry a US citizen, if you came here initially legally, um, regardless of whether you overstayed, you can then adjust your status within the United States and, and become a legal permanent resident without having to leave and come back in. And that's a big difference between someone who did not arrive here with authorization in the first place. They would have to leave before they could come back in. And typically when you overstay a visa, if you overstay for more than six months, there becomes a, a period of time where you have to stay outside the United States, either um, three to, to 10 years, depending on how long you overstay. Uh, the point being that, you know, there are ways to adjust those things and allow people maybe to to not have to do that. You know, we get a lot of family separation because those people right. who came here years ago, you see the stories of dads having to, to stay outside the United States for 10 years before they can come back in. Right. After they You're incentivizing it. people to stay here illegally because the penalty is so, so great. Exactly, exactly. So it would be a lot better almost, in my opinion, at least, if they were allowed to, um, once they have a path to legal status, come forward, do it, you know, and that way they can get their legal status and go about their lives and stay with their families. Cause oftentimes the kids of those people are us citizens by being born here. Um, one important thing to point out is even those people who don't have work authorization or don't have um, any legal status still pay taxes. They get what's called an ITIN number instead of a social security number. They pay taxes, they pay into our system and they have to, because if they ever do want to adjust their status and get on some path to legal status, they're going to have to show that they did those things correctly um, and that they were you know, contributing. So it, it goes a long way towards providing for their good moral character and everything else that the law wants to see to incentivize them. And they do often um, you know, pay into the system without getting any benefits. So it actually supports our system in many ways. Um, and, what, uh, and, and what about additional protections for, for, for children, um, whether they are you know, being w within uh, within the system, you know, why they are awaiting consideration for, you know, whether it's asylum or for, uh, you know, any other status, uh, or while they might be, you know, en route, certainly they're at great risk. Whether you know, you know, without getting into the to the details, children are at great risk. Um, are there additional protections? Uh, if not. Um, what what can be done uh, in order to you know ensure that that the children can be safer in the entirety of their their journey? Yeah, well, the entirety of the journey is impossible for us as as one country to to help them with, right? The majority of that journey is in Mexico, but once they do arrive at the U.S. border, there are a lot of things that can be done to ensure their safety. And ensure also that they're not being trafficked and they're not going to go into further harm once they're here. Um, so, you know, I mentioned earlier how the Remain in Mexico policy forced many people to do just that. And now we're seeing a lot more kids come in and we're overflowing what is the Office of Refugee Resettlement System for dealing with unaccompanied minors and having to use these convention centers and other kind of large facilities to house them. That, in a way, is protection. It's not the best. Um, I, you know, there was the Tornillo tent camps and there was a tent camp in Homestead, Florida. I, you know, they've been doing this for years now, opening these kind of temporary facilities for kids when there's an overflow need. But that is protection because we can't just let them come across and walk in. They're underage. We wouldn't let an underage, you know, U.S. citizen just wander around. Um, they would be taken into some type of foster care or something is my point. So in this case, there's protections in place, but the best way we can provide for them is to get them to their family members as fast as possible. Nobody wants to see a child held in an institutional setting, certainly not in one where it's, you know, in some type of an auditorium or, you know, bunk, you know, barracks style housing for these kids who are already traumatized. They're fleeing something in the first place. I think the president said it best in his, um, in his press conference a few weeks back. Nobody's coming here because Joe Biden's a nice guy. You know, they're coming here because they're fleeing things, and it's not just one factor. It really never is, I'm only fleeing because of this, which is what our asylum system wants to hear. But it's, it's often just a complicated 
you know, not of many things that, that I mentioned earlier, the kids need to be um, safely taken in and safely then reunified with their family member as quickly as possible so that they're held in an institutional or restrictive setting for the least amount of time possible. And then that not only benefits the child and puts them in a setting where they can live with their aunt or cousin or brother or mom um, while they're awaiting their day in court, they're still going to have to prove that they have a right to stay here. But it also takes the burden off of our government and caring for them and puts it back on the family to, to feed and house them and, and they can be in a safe setting. Um, so that's the real quick answer to that question. Yeah, thank you. And, and we're, we're just about out of time. And I, we may have to invite you back for uh, immigration reform part two down the road when things progress. Uh, 30 seconds. What are the chances that uh, that some or, or, or even all of this uh, this act passes? I'm not even going to put odds on what's going to go on with our Congress these days, uh, especially on the Senate side. Um, I'm not in any position to guess how that kind of horse trading is going to play out. That will have to happen. Uh, so I hope that they do the right thing. I hope they do the humane thing. And I hope that we show them America's values in, in the laws that we do pass and how we hold ourselves out to the rest of the world as being this shining beacon on a hill. And, and you know, in many respects, what people believe to be the greatest country in the history of the world, it should not shock anyone that people are willing to die to get here and to do anything they can to stay here. And so I think we need to have that reflected in our, in our immigration laws. Uh, well, that, that will have to be the last word and uh, was eloquent at that. Uh, Brandon, thank you so much for joining us and sharing your, uh, your insight into this uh, really important and uh, complex uh, subject. And as I said, we will have to have you back to continue our discussion. Uh, thank you all for joining us. I hope you've enjoyed uh, uh, Tobin Talks on this uh, Tuesday and join us next month uh, in May. We'll be talking um, about uh, Israel issues. Thanks so much. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you.